Hello, welcome to Emerging Civil War. Thanks for joining us to watch this video. Tonight, I am joined by some very special guests and we are gonna be talking about the movie Gettysburg, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary year. Can we believe that? Wow. Um, my name is Sarah K. Byerly. I serve as managing editor at Emerging Civil War. And tonight joining me are authors from Emerging Civil War and Emerging Revolutionary War. So we have Frank Jastrzemski, Tom McMillan, Brian Schwartz, and Dan Welch. So good evening. Thanks for being here. You're good welcome. Good evening. Uh, well, if we we're, we're meeting virtually, but I did bring popcorn, so we'll just have to pretend like we're sharing popcorn, <laughs> or everyone has their bowl of popcorn as we're talking about a movie. A movie here, so thirty years since Gettysburg has come out. Um, how many times have you seen the movie? Like a rough estimate, Frank. I'll start with you. Oh my gosh! I mean, do you count like starting off watching like the first day? And then maybe not watching the rest of it and then maybe deciding to pick up and watching the second day. I don't know. I mean, definitely over a dozen times. Um, and like I met, was briefly talking about, I mean, I've watched clips of it on YouTube, just scenes going back. Um, and that kind of gets me, gets, gives me the bug to watch it again, but too many times. <laughs> All right. So um, what about you? Uh, I'm really a nerd. I said to my wife, I told her about this question. I said, what do you think a hundred? And she said, I think that's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was true, then 101 was last night in honor of this. But it, the, the movie, I'm such a nerd because it's really important to me. Um, I had gone away from history coverage. I went to this movie on a Tuesday night in Pittsburgh in 93. I drove to Gettysburg three nights later. I've had the illness ever since. None of them, my book writing or any of this history volunteering stuff would have happened had I not seen that movie. So it really got me back into it. So I love it for that reason. That's really special. Brian, what about you? I'd say 12 to 15 times and, and like Frank, um, uncountable clips since then. There are certain moments I really enjoy. Other sections I just buzz through and don't <laughs> want to you know, see repeatedly. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to get to some of those favorite scenes here in just a moment. Dan, what's your estimate for how many times you've seen Gettysburg? I'd put it in the dozens. Uh, quite, quite a significant amount. Uh, but I, I would say that I probably listened to the soundtrack more than i've watched the movie so if it's been um, uh, listening to the soundtrack absolutely and dan i know you wrote an essay about the soundtrack so we're going to get to that a little bit later in our discussion here but as we're kind of continuing with our icebreaker questions let's talk about favorite scenes um now it may be hard to pick one or two favorites but let's try so um tom i'm going to start with you since you it sounds like you watched the movie most recently um, yeah what's and, your favorite it, scene it, it, it made this question more complicated because there are way too many but if i'm going to pick two uh, I would go for Buford. They're going to charge valiantly and uh, be butchered valiantly. And men in uh, tall hats and gold watch will pump, pump, pound their chest and say what a great charge it was. And then to me, there's so many others, but watching Pickett's charge, uh, I know it wasn't to, to the real historian realistic, but I felt like I was there. It's as close as I came. And I watched that all the time. I was doing a book on Armistead and Hancock and I watched that a lot. So I felt like I kind of got swept along in that. So those are kind of bookends, one at the beginning, one at the end that count as my favorites. Nice. Brian, what about you? A uh, favorite moment and a favorite sequence. Favorite moments when John Buford, Sam Elliott's up in the tower, the Lutheran Seminary, <laughs> excuse me, the cupola. He keeps looking back for infantry, sees nothing, turns back towards his cavalry. His aide looks back and calls to attention that John Reynolds is coming. Buford turns around. Here comes Reynolds' aide riding up. The music swells, and he rides up and asks what is happening. And as Buford comes down, then the Union infantry comes marching up. The, the hammer of the Confederates, shall we say. And then I agree with Pickett's charge. Um, I can watch that repeatedly. Uh, you, it feels like you're just swept up in it all the way to the wall and to your destruction. Right, exactly. Um, Dan, favorites from you? I think both of them uh, for me are centered around Tom Berenger's Longstreet character. I think the the first uh, scene that I particularly um, enjoy watching is when Berenger almost gives this soliloquy about having to order the death of the thing that he loves 
Uh, it's just a, such a powerful line uh, showing a connection between a general and and his uh, subordinates um, under his command. And then um, very similarly, when uh, Longstreet goes to see Hood in the field hospital, uh, it's one of the you know rare looks we get uh, of the you know the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg. Even though you know at the time that that Longstreet goes, the battle is is not over yet. But um, those two scenes would probably be my top two. Thanks for sharing those. Frank, your favorites? Well, all of those, of course. But I would say one that wasn't mentioned that I really like is at the end of July 1st, the, the first day of the battle, when Richard Anderson, which who plays George Meade, comes into the Leicester farmhouse, you know, and approaches Hancock. He's like, is this good ground, General? Is this good ground? And, you know, Brian Malone, who played Hancock's very, you know, confidently he's like very good ground sir very good ground it's just i mean i don't sound as good as him but <laughs> that <laughs> that just kind of really sets the scene for what's going to happen there and i just i don't know there's something about that music with mix or the the scene mixed with the soundtrack it's just i don't know that's really powerful mm -hmm. and i love how because the movie's being drawn from a novel loosely you know loosely based on the history of the battle which we'll, we'll talk about here in a moment but they're really able to weave together those conflicts and write some really beautiful dialogue that translates really nicely and I like the part in that scene um, that you've just described Frank where uh, Buford goes outside and he's it's almost like he's thinking through the day and you know mm -hmm. we held the ground Reynolds and you know it just kind of brings that day to a solid close so I find that some of my favorite scenes have changed over the years, um, but one that has always been one of my favorites is when we get all that smoke scene in the cannonade before Pickett's charge, and you have the Chamberlain brothers lying on the ground, and you see Joshua Chamberlain kind of pick up his head, and then you see Hancock riding through the smoke, and, you know, Hancock has just been telling Chamberlain in the movie about, you know, we're going to need leaders, and, you know, what is leadership, and they've kind of had that discussion, and then here's a very visual moment where Chamberlain seeing Hancock's leadership. So that's always been one of my favorites. While we're continuing on the theme of favorite favorites, um, favorite actor, favorite character in the movie. Um, let's see, I'm trying to mix up who's answering first. Uh, Tom, do you want to go first on this one? I went first last time, but I'll go oh, first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I'll try to, to keep mind. better track. <laughs> um, well, since I wrote a book on Armistead and Hancock, I'll say Louis Armistead and Richard Jordan. And there's a poignant story that he was ill during the movie, film, filming and, and died shortly afterwards. But other than the fact that he wasn't bald like Armistead was, I just that it was a very compelling character. Uh, you know, the, the, it was written in a novel in a way unlike the way Armistead really was. But Richard Jordan played it perfectly for the way it was written. So he did a brilliant acting job. I, it's whenever I see him, something I, he's always Lewis Armistead now to me. And the other one, just real quickly, is a, a, a character who really shouldn't have been there, Buster Kilrain, because mm. he was just a perfect. I know why Shara did it. He, he needed a transitional character, and I know so many guides have told me that they take people up to the 20th Main, especially years ago, and all the the dead from the 20th Main are listed on that monument. And so, so many people were asking, "Where's Buster Kilrain?" And they had great <laughs> news to him that it was a made up character. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, where history, memory, and uh, movies kind of have to intersect. Yeah. <laughs> the breaking of the hard news there. Yes. Yeah. Dan, do you have a favorite character or actor? Favorite actor. Uh, wow, that's a hard one. Um, and it it may just because it, for me it may just be because of his association with many other um, great projects that he was involved with. But Martin Sheen. Definitely um, my favorite actor that appeared in the film. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not 100% sold on his performance as as Robert E. Lee, um, <laughs> as the movie has aged to the 30 year point, um, perhaps in those early years after its release, um, you know, I, I would have had a higher percentage on, on uh, my belief of his performance as Lee, but uh, definitely my favorite actor. Uh, my def my favorite character um or you know that was portrayed i really enjoyed um i really enjoyed the dialogue between pickett and kemper mm -hmm. so somewhere between those two on the evening of july 2nd and the whole gentleman's club conversation <laughs> um but um you know I, I really enjoyed their their banter back, back and forth as historic as as characters not as historical figures 
Excellent. Frank, favorites? Um, well, obviously Chamberlain, you know, <laughs> Jeff Daniels is Chamberlain. Uh, I love Sam, Sam Elliott. I mean, I'm a huge Sam Elliott fan, but, you know, for one of the, not one of the people that don't appear as much on screen that had a big impact, I would say is probably Brian Malone as Hancock. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time he's on the screen, it's, it's a powerful, it just has, gives this powerful sense of, you know, he's in control um, and he kind of captures the audience. Um, and it, you know, I've been able to meet him in person too, which is super cool. Um, but yeah, I would say probably Brian Malone as Hancock. Um, like I said, Sam Elliott. I mean, I, I love Tombstone and yeah. um, some of the, he, you know, there's a lesser known series he was in called Gone to Texas, where he plays Sam Houston, actually. Um, it was a made for TV series. I like him in that. So um, I could go on and on, but yeah, I would say probably Jeff Daniels, Sam Elliott, Brian Malone are my, up, up there. Excellent selections. And rounding off this part of the conversation, Brian, your favorites. Sam Elliott is John Buford. He brings a grittiness to uh, and a combat veteran's eye to the role as he's playing. It. You know, granted, he's not that frequently seen, but when he's seen, he's dominating the people around him. And just, I really enjoyed the way he handled himself among the horse soldiers, much better than John Wayne <laughs> and actually the movie by the same name <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yes and the the scene where we get Buford's cavalry riding into Gettysburg it's just beautiful and I know we keep coming back to the music but the music's so good that's probably one of the clips that I go back and watch the most just because it's it's beautiful on film but it's also like is this what it could have been like with the cavalry riding into Gettysburg like that yeah. so kind of continuing with the the theme of the actors here in the film um frank you had the opportunity to interview patrick gorman and it appeared as a blog post on the emerging civil war blog and it also most recently appeared in the Civil War and Pop Culture Essay Collection. And would you like to share about the experience of interviewing? Yeah, so I, I he's another actor I've had the opportunity to meet I, at the 25th anniversary, and I won't get into de too much detail yet about that. But um, he's just, he's like the epitome of a working actor. Um, he's been in, I think, over 50 films, um, literally thousands of plays, TV commercials, um, just TV series. Um, episodes um it, his acting career goes back even he he did some stage work with judy garland i mean he's been around for a long time um he was in the avengers end games he was the, the double for um chris uh, evans um steve rogers character so at the end of that movie he was like the old the old steve rogers so he's done all kinds of different stuff but um yeah just he, he's such an interesting individual because he's very approachable um, and just reaching out to him to interview him. I mean, he was more than willing to do it. Um, but it seems like, you know, at first for him, so he, he originally went out to, or to start to get the role, he, he had to pitch him, he pitched himself. So he pretty much went in as a messenger and, you know, delivered to the casting agent, a picture of himself mm -hmm. Um and just kind of slid it in. Um, and they call they actually gave him a call. And he said that in the interview, um, he ends up talking about how they had a hard time finding someone to play the role of Hood. Um, but he, you know, he took it, you know, he he was more than willing to do it and he took did it. And I mean, I think he did a great job with it. I mean, um, Ron Maxwell ends up saying that a lot of his quotes from the movie are the most memorable. Mm -hmm. Um, the whole rolling the rocks down on the hill on you. Um, and he's another one, like, like I said, Brian Malone, he's not in the movie a lot, but when he is, he just captures your attention and he's, he's very memorable in the film. Um, um, I think I mentioned in the interview that I did with him as well. Um, he's super into like martial arts and Japanese calligraphy. Hmm. Um, and at one point he talks about when he's in the, or when he's filming Gettysburg, he's like there, I think he's at the Gettysburg hotel and he's doing Japanese calligraphy it's like not something you picture General Hood doing while you know, at night um I'm trying to think what else he really talked about um 
One of the things that I loved in the interview that you were able to highlight is just how seriously he took the history with the role and, you know, that he had done a lot of reading about Hood and that actually some historians had reached out to him after the movie. Yeah, he he did. He did a lot of research and reading, which is good. You know, it's the nice thing is I've heard a lot of the actors put in a lot of time and effort to really get to know these people. Um, you know, he said his best way of describing when he thinks of Hood, he thinks of attack. And that was his his mindset of when he thought about him and he kind of looked at him as like a tragic and romantic hero. Mm -hmm. Um, He may not have necessarily identified with everything Hood believed in or stood for, but you know, he, he did his best to kind of capture Hood's personality on the battlefield or what he thought he would have been like. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I said, a lot of, from what I've heard and read, you know, Stephen Lang was kind of similar with, or similar with uh, Pickett um, and Longstreet with Tom Berenger, you know, they, um, that was another thing, um, that, um, Patrick Gorman had mentioned with Longstreet. He apparently, uh, Tom Berenger had made swords for all of his staff officers and other generals and presented them to them. So that's during the interview. I talked with Patrick about that a little bit. Uh, you know, he got a sword, custom sword from mm-hmm. Berenger. Um, so yeah, like I said, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet him in person and he's very personable and just, you know, he, he loves the fans. I mean, he loves, you know, he loves engaging with them. Um, he's he one of always, the- he will always point to the right. Whenever you get a photo of there, everybody <laughs> wants him to point to the right. He willingly does it every time. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, gone to the right. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Well, that, that's unfortunate. They kind of cut out um, some of the hosp- hospital scene, the original hospital scene he was in. It sounded like they had it like the uncut version. They have a longer hmm him in the hospital and i think they ended up cutting some of it out i just would wish we'd have seen more of him on the screen um because he is he, he does a good job playing hood even though he's much older than hood and you know hood is a little taller i think hood was like almost six foot or something along those lines gorman's a little shorter than that but um yeah i mean just i think he did a wonderful job and it was like i said it was a wonderful opportunity meeting him and kind of talking with him That's really special, and I'm so glad that you were able to do that interview and share it with the emerging Civil War community. Um, Another essay that's in the Civil War and Pop Culture Collection is one that you wrote, Tom, and you were sharing about Gettysburg Reconsidered and kind of your introduction to the movie and how your thoughts around it have evolved um, in your historian journey. Could you take us through some of that? Yes, yeah, Sarah. As I was mentioning earlier, I had I'd always loved history, but I just you know, life and career sometimes gets in the way, and I had not been involved very much. And I went to the movie by myself. You can't really get a get a lot of people to say, "Hey, I'm going to watch a four and a half hour movie on the Civil War." <laughs> uh, but I went. I came to Gettysburg three nights later. I I I got the bug, and I've been there ever since. But for the criticism early on, and a lot of park rangers did this too. They would criticize the movie for being inaccurate. And you, if you look at it, it's based on a novel. I mean, my, Michael Shara never said he was writing a scholarly history of the Battle of the Gettysburg. The word novels in the subhead. So shame on us. It won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Mm-hmm. Shame on us for thinking. And it's, once it gets to the big screen, those things are very powerful. But what it did for me, it got me to start studying underneath it. And I found a lot of things in the movie were wrong, but I'm not offended by that. It was a Hollywood movie, but you can find out if you want. That led to my book on Armistead and Hancock, but there were where it's really romanticized in the movie. But there's a lot of that. Uh, but I think for a lot of people like me, I think there are a lot of people like me who it got them into studying and finding out the real story. And you still appreciate the movie and, and, and the novel, but you put it in context, uh, you know, and, and again, the movie makers, that wasn't a documentary. It wasn't supposed to be. So it's just it. I'm just to pray. The mo- big screen is so powerful that people see things on the big screen and they think they're real. And, uh, and the, the, the biggest, you know, historic, one of the biggest historic flaws of the movie is the quotes I mean, that's what Shara did. He tried to put words in these guys' mouths that they might have said in that context, but people think they really did say them. Uh, and, and it's good to me for a way I was able to write a book about it I mean, I, when I did Armistead and Hancock, but I think that's it. But it's still very important. And I think it remains important to this day. I, I live half the time in Gettysburg now, and this weekend coming up, it's a big celebration here. A number of the actors are going to be here. Tom Berger is going to be here for the first time, maybe since he made the movie. Um, and people are, are excited about it. they're going to have panels with the you know with the actor. So it, it's it still means a lot to people. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's the the beauty and the challenge, like that that juxtaposition, if you will, that tension that we get with the movie um, is is giving us that inspiration from the history. And and that's you know, that's where we find it and adding so much to the inspiring and uh, those scenes that just make us kind of catch our breath is the music a wonderful soundtrack and excellent score. Um, Dan, you wrote about your connection with the soundtrack going back to cassette tapes and then all the other times you've listened to it. Um, also in an essay um, published in the Civil War and Pop Culture book. Do you want to share about that? Yeah, so, you know, my early connection with the movie, um, you, know, I, I, you know, was a family trip, one of many. Um, we happened to be there while they were filming scenes from the movie. You know, we headed back out for another family trip the following year. The movie was out at that point. And uh, the soundtrack um, was available on cassette and being sold in many of the um, gift shops in and around Gettysburg at the time. So it was kind of one of those mementos. Uh, every family trip, we had a few more mementos come back from Gettysburg, and that was one of them. So uh, I, you know, I for whatever reason, I, I didn't know my my journey ahead as, as a professional muse musician and music teacher. Um, but, you know, I was kind of hooked uh, to the soundtrack. We listened to it once uh, through in, in the station wagon on cassette. And, uh, you know, the, the next five plus hours, just flip it over, you know, eject, flip it over, eject. And uh, much to the chagrin of, of everybody else in the station wagon on that <laughs> long ride home. Um, and that was kind of, uh, you know, that was kind of the, the thing um, for me was 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 I really attached myself to the music. Um you know, one of the hardest heart soul crushing moments, however, was, you know, as, as I became a professional musician and uh, went to music school and, and studied music professionally, um, you know, realizing that, oh, this this thing, this these these iconic musical clips that, you know, uh, accompanied some of these dramatic moments in the film were, you know, all done on a synthesizer. They weren't real musicians playing you know real trumpets and real horns and real strings it was one musician uh, with a midi file on a synthesizer so that was a, that was a hard you know a hard blow in my formative uh, musician years but uh, I've since returned back to to the love of it recognizing it for what it is and and uh, working out at Gettysburg for the last 16 plus years now you know every every anniversary it's still on in the car on july one two and three yeah it's 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 migrated from cassette to mp3 now or or whatever the the file types are on our cell phones but uh, it's definitely still a constant companion in the vehicle absolutely have you played certain parts of the soundtrack as you've driven across certain parts of the battlefield no i tend to you know just put it on and and let it go um, okay now you know there was just like the the movie has uh as as frank was talking about an extended director's cut the soundtrack did as well um the soundtrack was incredibly popular when it came out um several years after the movie came out and the soundtrack was released there was still a a, a large demand for the soundtrack so they released a second uh soundtrack called you know more songs from the you know the movie gettysburg and and that had a lot of the um period music uh, mm -hmm. that was performed in the film uh, instead of just some of the main themes on synthesizer and then there was a still a clamoring for that and a two disc deluxe special edition anniversary celebration type uh, version of of the Gettysburg soundtrack with uh, even more music that was included so um, for me it's it's uh, you gotta go with the full thing if I'm gonna sit down and watch it uh, like, you know, Frank was talking about, I'm watching the director's cut. I'm not watching the, you know, the uh, original theatrical release. And if I'm going to listen to the soundtrack and let it play as I drive, it's it's going to be the the fully loaded, you know, 30 plus track extended edition uh, soundtrack version. So, Die hard fan with the music and the long versions of the movie. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Um, Brian, you have written a book for the Emerging Civil War series about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who is a main character in the movie Gettysburg, um, played by Jeff Daniels. So take us through some of that. What do you think with the movie? What do you think with the history you've studied? 
what and uh, we'll show the cover of your book here on the screen. Oh, and I should also mention, um, we'll put links to all of these books and some of the articles and stuff um, in the description of this video in the blog post as well. Um, so Brian, the book, the the man, the movie, Gettysburg. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, I do know Jeff Daniels was a few inches taller than uh, <laughs> Joshua Chamberlain, who did reach six feet. He was not a shrinking violet height wise. Chamberlain himself, of course, being a college professor, showed no inclination to being a warrior. He uh, used to hunt when he was a kid, but he didn't like shooting birds and animals and such, even though his father would have him do so. So it's surprising that he would be willing to go to war and to learn as well as he did that he could take over for Adelbert Ames when he moved up to brigadier status. Uh, during the Chancellorsville campaign. Uh, my research about Chamberlain has um, convinced me that he really enjoyed military life. He writes about that to his wife in the fall of 1862. You know, he's come from Bowdoin College, which is very staid, very congregationalist. And he is now in the army where he can give some orders. Of course, he has to take them. And... There's also the sensation in his letters to Fanny and his and uh, conversations with others right after a little round top that he is surprised at how well both he and the 20th Maine boys performed during that fight. I suspect he might have had a different reaction if they'd been overrun and uh, William Oates had rolled up at least the third brigade. He was right in the thick of the fighting. I'm not quite sure if he was firing his pistol and shooting Confederates right and left like Jeff Daniels was during that long uh, defense little round top, which is you know the, the longest sequential combat action to which Ted Turner devoted in the movie, which is a surprise. I understand from what I've read that the background terrain, the rocks, the trees and such were fairly accurate to how Little Round Top looked then. Obviously, it's different now thanks to the War Department um, blowing up some of the rocks to build the road, Chamberlain Avenue, and now the National Park Service has repaved it so people can walk up around the top side of Little Round Top. Uh, Chamberlain with, with Little Round Top, um, I believe it made his, I want to say this, for him it was probably the high point of his military service in the sense that again, he went into that battle not knowing what to expect, and for the first time he's commanding a regiment in combat. He comes out of it and he suddenly realizes, hey, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And you sense as the war proceeds, again, in his letters home, his letters to others, his memoirs after the war, the growing confidence, which began to develop at the fight, Little Round Top. He, of course, decades after the war, let's say starting about 20 years later in the 1880s, some of his comrades began to dispute just who gave what command and <laughs> to the 20th Maine Infantry Regiment, but I sorted that out in the chapter in passing through the fire and afterwards discovered the um, discovered in quotation marks the letter that Ellis Spear wrote home to a friend and which published in the Portland Press Herald here in Maine in late July 1863 that basically buttresses Chamberlain's initial reports of July 6th and the next few days and uh, belies what Ellis Spear had to say in 1915. About a year after Chamberlain died, he could no longer conveniently defend himself. The um, It was interesting researching him. I do wish there had been more material available about Fanny, his wife. Mm -hmm. She, um, you know, as far as Chamberlain, the man, she he is like a solar flare, and she's almost like a a, um, a shadow 
over the moon, somewhere behind that solar flare. Hmm. That's that's uh, one aspect of his life that someone really needs to dig into and try to bring it out. But I have learned that there is not much more material available than what's already been made available. I love the movie. One little anecdote, if I can share it, because I think I'm the oldest one by far here by a ways. Um, first went to Gettysburg in 1989, parked in a little round top, looked around, finally found uh, the little sign pointing into the overgrown narrow trail going down to the 20th Main's um, monument. I mean, it was overgrown. I mean, you can walk through, you can brush it. You know the brush there with your elbows. Uh, we came back in '95, no later than '96. Parked on the little round top, and by golly, the National Park Service looks like they built an interstate highway going down <laughs> to it. A much wider trail, a better sign. Um, so for the movie Gettysburg, that put Chamberlain the 20th Main on the map again, and at least from the Pine Tree State. I must say thank you to uh, Ted Turner for doing so. Absolutely. We're going to talk about some of those changes and the Gettysburg effect, if we can loosely call it that later. Um, thanks for sharing those impressions, Brian, and for sharing your experience with the movie and with the research. Um, kind of along those lines, um, Tom, you wrote a book a, look, focusing on Winfield Scott Hancock and Louis Armistead's friendship and their military time um, when they were in the same location, shall we say, um, before the Civil War, before the secession crisis and all that. Um, do you want to share a little bit about that and some of maybe the top things that you found most different between what we see in the movie versus the real history? Yeah, and so it was an interesting research journey, and I did find that the real story is compelling, which is why I wrote a book about it. It's just not the story that's in the movie. And probably the first thing that most upsets people when I do my Civil War roundtable talks <laughs> is that Low was probably not Armistead's nickname. <laughs> there is very scant evidence to that. But now because of the movie, it doesn't matter because it's his nickname to everybody. I wrote about it. It's not central to the story. I wrote about it in an appendix, which I titled Low and Behold. But that was the first thing that really struck me. Um, they were they were friends. They certainly were friends. And I think they were pretty good friends. They were not almost brothers. I mean, in the 13 years between the Mexican War and the Civil War, they barely saw each other. I, I do think they got together out in California. They did serve in, they served on the frontier for 16 months in the, in the 40s, and they served side by side in the Mexican Wars. So they built that bond to soldiers. That was true. Um, but there, you know, people think they was, went to West Point together. They didn't go to West Point together. Uh, so uh, uh, just getting into all of that uh, in, in the real story of these guys and what their friendship was and what their interaction was, was fascinating to me. Uh, and the other thing I think, just to not take up too much time in the movie, it's that final climactic scene. First of all, they were not, there's no evidence that they were talking about facing each other. They probably knew they were facing each other at that point, but they were, it wasn't, oh, Winnie boy, oh, low, and they're wanting to meet each other. No, that stuff didn't happen. But at the end, when Armistead is wounded, and obviously he was, you know, it wasn't Tom Chamberlain who came up to it, it was Henry Bingham, who was a captain on, on Hancock's staff. But he he did not know at the time that, that Hancock was wounded. That, you know, that that wasn't information that was available to him. But it, it great, made such a great movie scene. And maybe the biggest thing that that other than Lowe's, than the nickname that, that uh, I think, challenges people's thoughts on this was that that phrase early in the movie when Armistead is talking to Longstreet in that long drawn out campfire scene I was talking about the farewell out in California and he says he quotes himself as saying when so help me if I ever raise my hand against you may God strike me dead there's no evidence that he said that the only person who was at the movie or at that meeting was Hancock's wife Elmira she said he didn't say may God strike me dead but it was if I'm ever forced to leave the soil of my native state, should worse come to worst. So that was Michael Shara taking a quote that was there and really enhancing it. But when people talk who don't do the research, which is most people, talk about Armistead and Hancock, they always talk about that phrase. And when people come up and argue with me after my talks, it's about Armistead's nickname and that phrase, because they're sure that they saw that he said it. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it, it almost encapsulates like how it was used in the fiction and then how it was used in the movie like it gives us that sense of brothers war which yeah, yeah. is a theme in so many civil war films so it's taking like that little bit of history that's true and then just making it so much and, and, I, and I think that's what and Michael Shara who's a brilliant writer I think that's what he was trying to do mm-hmm. I think he was trying to he had to take one example of friendship of a brothers war and this was it in Gettysburg mm-hmm. but he had to enhance it to get the major point of it. So I didn't have any problem with that. It's just right. when I was reading about it, sort of the research, I thought, wait a second, this isn't what happened. Right. <laughs> but the real story is pretty, I think if people just knew the real story and didn't know the movie, they would think it's a fascinating story of these two guys. It's just some people now get disappointed because they want to believe what they saw in the movie. Absolutely. And we're sharing a lot of books with our viewers who are watching this. So be sure to check them out. And Tom's book is really great for getting into the history. And like he said, it's a story on its own. So explore beyond the movie a little bit with Chamberlain, with Hancock, with Armistead. Uh, so, Dan, you've mentioned that you've worked at Gettysburg, I think you said for about 16 years. Um, so you've seen changes in people coming to Gettysburg, in their interests. Can you kind of walk us through some of that? How's the movie Gettysburg impacted positively, negatively um, for the park, for people coming in? Yeah, I, you know, I think when the movie Gettysburg came out, um, it, you know, Brian was sharing his story about kind of the before and after of, of Little Round Top. I think one of the challenges that the Park Service sit, uh, faced, and, you know, I was not there at that time. I was, you know, still coloring with crayons uh, <laughs> when the movie came out. But, um, you know, um, one of the the challenges, uh, or at least a perceived challenge, was how do you deal with this massive influx of visitors um, coming to very specific parts of the battlefield, Mm -hmm. you know, Little Round Top, the fields of Pickett's Charge. Um, How do you provide accessibility at the same time um, that you are are preserving that site for future generations? So I think that was a a, a very large challenge um, for the folks at Gettysburg. And I think the Park Service uh, handled it quite well, Um, you know, you know, as Brian was mentioned, what well, you know, they had you know, there's a paved path down there now. Well, it's the paved path, the already formed social trail that provides more erosion and destabilization to that landscape. You know, it's a fine line, it's a hard line, uh, and it's it's one of the things that I think has been challenging with the Park Service's um, you know rehabilitation of Little Round Top for the last 18 months. It's it's become a beloved site uh, because of the power uh, of the movie and the story that that focuses on it. You know, and as Brian said, it's one of the longest uh, action scenes, you know, of, of the entire movie. Uh, you know, the hardest part was the double VHS tape. You know, you're halfway through Little Round Top and you got to get up and put the second tape in to keep watching the Little Round Top scene. But um, so that, that was definitely one of the early challenges. Um, and I think the Park Service as well um, wanted to ensure that um, one of those reactions was, uh, you know, interpreting those moments, trying to provide some more um, context to what became a touchstone for many people, which was, you know, Chamberlain, Little Round Top, and Pickett, and, you know, Pickett's Charge, and, and Cemetery Ridge, you know, offering more programming options for visitors to attend to, um, you know, kind of explore those stories a little deeper. I, I think one of the things that I've witnessed over the last 16 years, though, and maybe it's just my my level of humor, um, if you will, or injection of humor thereof in, into public programming, is that the movie Gettysburg, although a touchstone for a certain um, demographic, um, particularly an age demographic, it is not a touchstone for the mass majority of visitors any longer. Hmm. Um, You know, you make a a Tom Berenger beard joke or a uh, Jeff Daniels mustache joke. And, you know, there's not that reaction like, oh, I I know Jeff Daniels played, you know, Joshua Chamberlain or yeah, that beard that Tom Berenger had to wear was terrible. Um, You're not seeing your, your mass number of visitors having that as their touchstone any longer. Um, So I think that, you know, I believe it was Tom mentioning the 30th anniversary celebration of the movie in Gettysburg this weekend. I, I think if you were to attend those events, you would you would see a very specific demographic and, and, and age demographic that's there. And I, I don't see the, the, a 
future generations of visitors to Gettysburg, and I don't see future generations of even up and coming historians um, utilizing that as a touchstone. You know, working with a, a number of our interns and seasonal staff, um, you know, that that work at the park, never having seen the movie before mm -hmm. coming to work at Gettysburg, I think is also a, a sign that how, you know, we are interacting with this moment in um, popular culture from 1993 and its relationship to an actual historical event in place is shifting in the 21st century. So maybe there's room for a novel and then a movie that focuses on the Union's right flank in Culp's Hill. Is oh, that what I'm hearing you say, Dan? Yes, I would absolutely <laughs> love that. I, you know, I, I think that that story, the Culp's Hill story, the more I've gotten into it over the years is, uh, this this may rub some folks on this call to see the Zoom was the wrong way and some of our watchers later, but I think it's every bit as compelling, if not more compelling than um, what the movie focused on. And in many cases, uh, I think that the as you dig through the primary sources of what happened on the Union right and the Confederate left, uh, there may even be better, you know, uh, ways in which to bring out many of the themes that Shara did. Uh, you know, Sarah, you mentioned that this common theme in, in Civil War popular culture, of, you know, a brother's war, uh, you know, and within yards of each other on on cemetery, or excuse me, Culp's Hill, we're seeing Marylanders fight Marylanders. So, um, you know, just a number of those stories and, you know, no shade to, to Joshua Chamberlain, but David Ireland on uh, the 137th New York on <laughs> Culp's Hill had a far taller task um and then then the 20th main did over on the little round top at least in this historian's opinion I, i'd love to debate brian on that at some point but uh um yeah so I, I i think there's there's a whole lot more room um for documentary style or docudrama style or future future movies um and and novels based on some of those moments and and personalities from the battle I, you know i'd love to see a love to see a dan sickles biopic at some point i mean you don't even need to write a script just you know <laughs> just have his letters and correspondence and trial transcripts read and it's a movie unto itself so brian you got a a, a response there i know we're turning next to the left flank and little round top <laughs> discussion okay. I would agree with Dan in terms of what went on at Culp's Hill was every bit as important and bloody um, as what went on down a little round top. I mean, yeah. I grew up in Brewer, Maine, on what we called Upper Chamberlain Street. And of course, Joshua Chamberlain grew up in what we would call Lower Chamberlain Street. Yeah. And when I was going through Brewer schools during the Civil War Centennial. It was Joshua Chamberlain, 20th Maine, won the Battle of Gettysburg and saved the Union. But I've come to appreciate that there were far many other Union regiments at, at uh, Gettysburg that played just as vital a role. Absolutely. And let's let's delve into that for a minute. And I'll I'll start the conversation with you, Brian, but if others want to jump in, please do. Um, so we have the the facts of what happened, and then we have guys remembering after the battle. So men like Chamberlain who survived, who are gonna write about the battle, who may receive um medals of honor for their actions there or other commendations. Um, and they're gonna start adding more um layers of memory or sparkling memory to what they did. Uh, can you walk us through a little of, of that um, that Chamberlain does in some of his post-war writings, Brian? I believe that Chamberlain and many of the other, let's say the officers who were writing in the decades after the war, their stories, we would say their stories changed but what I'm seeing is that they probably um, met comrades or shared material with you know, with each other, that they gained a greater knowledge of what was involved in the fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chamberlain in the center, he really couldn't see Ellis Spear very well over in the left flank. There wasn't very far away, but through the smoke, the noise and everything. Um he really couldn't have been fully aware as to what his enlisted men were going through. There's too much motion, too much action, too much violence, noise, stench of gunpowder, uh, and such. Mm -hmm. 
so as time passed, and I'm not, I'm not just, it's not just Chamberlain, but I believe others, as they gained more knowledge, you know, they talk with, go to these regimental reunions, and you get talking with comrades, and they're talking about, okay, I was over here, and say the 20th Maine, I'm anchored against 83rd Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Well, he's that soldier there is going to be having different memories and experience. I should say experiences and therefore memories. Then the um, Andrew Tosher holding the national colors at the apex with Company F, or Ellis Spear out commanding the left flank. Chamberlain. I do not see anywhere where he embellishes memoirs or his memories, shall we say. Mm -hmm. I know this is where, particularly starting with Holman Melcher in the 1880s and continuing continuing on through Ellis Spear about 1915 after Chamberlain's death, there are accusations and ironically almost all originating here in Maine that uh, what he claimed to have done at first at Little Round Top and then Ella Spear backdates it to the assault on Reese Heights at Fredericksburg that he really didn't do what he did. But uh, the evidence available through other sources indicates, not again, nothing I can see on Chamberlain's part where he embellished. Hmm. I do believe that he and, again, other soldiers, particularly the officers, as they are writing their memoirs, after the war, they're gaining more knowledge all the time. I mean, you cannot go to different regimental association meetings year after year after year, or like Chamberlain going to Gettysburg several times for you for reunions, and not encounter people that can say, hey, this is what I was doing, or we were doing over here. Um, I, I'm comfortable with the memoirs that he left of Gettysburg and the other battles in which he fought during the war, that was the genesis of my book, was to write about his wartime experiences. Mm -hmm. And the footnotes that are available online would indicate that I cast my net for Chamberlain-related material or material related to, the, say, the other units he was commanding when he became a brigadier. Um, cast that very wide, and I found nothing that was of a disagreement. There, I'm it's saying that's not there. I, I think it's a, it's a good point that sometimes we don't think about that. Guys do, you know, when talking to other soldiers, they do yep. get other perspectives because you only see what's in front of you. Uh, having said that, in general, not related to Chamberlain, uh, it's it's still always best to look at the most contemporary accounts. Right. right. I can't remember what I did last week. If I was writing about what I did 30 years ago, I don't know if it's right or not. So I don't even, I, I don't even, sometimes when I think they embellish or change, we can choose that. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose. I think you just forget. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there's obvious situations though. Again, this is not specific to Chamberlain, but uh, but anybody else. You also know how history is remembering. Mm -hmm. Let's We're all like that. I mean, nobody ever retreated. We're always forced back because the other side gave way. It was the most gallant fight ever. And everybody says that in every war. And, and I don't take away from anybody who fought in battle. I certainly didn't. But I think you always have to do that. But I know when I do my research, I try to get the closest contemporary account. Mm -hmm. I think you know, that's what they remember right there. But it is a good point that you can, 20 years later, you could talk to somebody else. Say, I didn't even realize that was happening over there. That changes my account. So I think it's it's a blend of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too, um, looking at some of Chamberlain's later writings. I'm thinking about when he writes uh, "Passing Through Blood." I think it's "Passing Through Blood and Fire" at Gettysburg. Um, one thing that really stood out to me when I first read that is how much he writes about the men, and you know, just like scenes that he's recalling in one way or another. Um, and he writes so much with we or those. Um, it, it's less a story of I, but he's trying to tell the story of the regiment. And um, mm -hmm. some of his, you know, war letters are. He's a very eloquent writer, of course, but I think he finds his stride with his eloquence when he gets to those like memorial speeches or when he's some of the monument dedication speeches. And there's times when I've been reading some of his writings because I, you know, I love the way he wrote, and I feel like 
we're almost getting the Jeff Daniels in post-war Chamberlain writings, <laughs> some of Jeff Daniels' speeches or, or the inspiration for it. Uh, any thoughts on that uh, from, from the group before we change to our next subject? I think the conversation really underscores the importance of, uh, you know, the professional historian and what historians do um, versus um, enthusiasts or, arm, you know, armchair generals, things of that nature, is how to discern, you know, what is the truth between an official report that was written on July the 6th, 1863, and a speech they gave in Boston in 1898, um, you know, recounting the same event. Um, you know, what is the fog of war? What was their perspective? What has colored those stories in the 35 years uh, in between? Um, I, I think that the the art of, you know, um, having those skills it, it is an art form it, it, and, and learning how to, you know, really dig into history um, in, a, in a very um, deep, uh, deep way that that helps to understand what we've been discussing, um, which is how these narratives can shift. And in a larger picture for tonight's conversation, how those shifting narratives then affect um, a, a novel based on historical events and historical writings. Mm -hmm. Sarah, can I throw in one chain of memory that I know people have discounted? Okay. He writes post-war about the uh, young uh, private busted down from sergeant named George Buck. He's from Aroosa County up here in, in northern Maine. Um, Chamberlain has promised him back in the spring, perhaps late winter of 62, 63, that the opportunity comes to promote him to sergeant. And so when he learns that Buck's been mortally wounded laying out in the line there, he goes out and says he kneels and promises to uh, raise him to, you know, make him a sergeant before he dies. Mm -hmm. Some historians have poo-pooed that story. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the story actually has a backdated eyewitness. Um, the 20th Maine got a new quartermaster in late 1862. The guy was a psychopath. And so in uh, that January or February, the 20th Maine, most of the men had gone out, perhaps during the mud march. George Buck was a sergeant, very sick. He was in the uh, regimental hospital. And this quartermaster, of course, the lieutenant, he comes along and tells Buck he wants him to do some sort of physical labor. And Buck just responded that, I'm sick. I don't have to do physical labor. The, the uh, psychopath knocks him down, mm -hmm. then reports him to Adelbert Ames, who was not... Uh, uh, friend, uh, not friendly towards his men or caring for his men like Chamberlain was. Mm -hmm. And um, Ames bus bucked down to private. Chamberlain hears about it. And that's when he promises himself he's going to promote Buck. Mm -hmm. What the backdated witness is, is that in the, in, on the hospital grounds, there was a nurse from Callis, Maine, helping to care for the Maine boys. She saw this entire incident happen. So it was based on a this was based on truth. Hmm. I cannot see why Chamberlain, given the way he cared for his men, would not have gone out the firing line probably after the battle was over hmm. and spoken with Buck. Hmm. But it's one of those stories that some people just say couldn't have happened. Right. And it's interesting how different primary sources, like finding those before the Battle of Gettysburg about his demotion and things like that can kind of tie together and help us get that bigger picture and kind of confirm each other. I call it cross checking. I love it when I find primary sources that are written in real time, like real, you know, right there and then not 10 years later. And they, you know, they they check each other out. Um, so thanks for sharing that story. Um, Frank, let's bring it back to the Gettysburg movie. 30th anniversary. So you've seen the movie a few times on the big screen for different anniversaries, right? Um, well, so I was able to go in 2018 to the 25th anniversary um, showing, which was sweet because my wife surprised me. Um, she bought tickets before it sold out. Um, and we we're about at the time we were living in Northeast Ohio, which is about six hours away. So we worked that Friday and drove halfway and stopped and then drove the rest away and got there on Saturday. Um, and she's never seen Gettysburg's through and through. I mean, she tolerates history. She 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 goes with me all on the cemetery trips and, you know, 
all that, but it, it was a tall order for her um, to sit through the whole thing, but she did. Um, and it was the uncut version, director's uncut. Um, and it was funny during the intermission, she actually bumped into Ron Maxwell and he, and she's like, yeah, Ron Maxwell, the director of the movie asked me how I liked the movie. And I'm like, oh gosh, please tell him that you <laughs> that's like the concession stands which she she said yeah i'm here with my husband it's the first time i'm you know i've seen it but yeah i'm enjoying it um but it was so cool like seeing a, a bunch of the actors were there um you know not you know martin sheen wasn't there and tom berenger but you know a lot of the ones i've mentioned were there um and it was just almost like surreal seeing these people because you grew up watching this movie and then they're just walking around, you know, and greeting people. And they were super, you know, like approachable. Um, you know, they really made it a great experience, I think, for all of the people that were there to see it. Um, at one point, I was actually, why well, I had I had an opportunity to meet Patrick Gorman in person there. Um, I had met Brian Malone. I was staying at the same hotel as Brian Malone, actually. Wow. I ran into him in the hallway, which is bizarre, too, because you're walking down the hallway. It's like, is that Hancock? Down the hall? <laughs> <laughs> I said hello to him and I actually saw him before I left too, which was really cool. Um, and there were so many fans there, you know, tr you know, they were wanting just to shake hands with the actors and have them sign merchandise. You know, I just, it was just happy. I was just happy to be able to just kind of shake hands and say, you know, thank you for your performance. You know, this is a movie that impacted me. Um, at one point I was actually in the restroom and I'm using the restroom and I, I hear, someone say something to someone else. I'm like, man, that sounds like E.P. Alexander talking to <laughs> George Pickett. I'm not kidding you. I looked next to me, Stephen Lang standing next to me. And then um, James Patrick Stewart, who played Alexander's, washing his hands at the sink. They were talking to each other. And it was like, I was almost like, I wanted to say something to him, but I was like almost starstruck because I'm like, that just, it completely blew my mind. I'm like, so I'm standing in the bathroom with Pickett and E.P. Alexander. I'm like, this is, bizarre <laughs> um but yeah it was just seeing it on the big screen um with the actors there was just super cool and then I, yeah i mean i saw the uncut director's uncut version um which was the first time i've ever seen it um there at the theater where it was originally the original showing was at was super neat um, but yeah the overall experience just you know it's it's one of those things that you know i i wish i could make it to the 30th um Unfortunately, I can't, but, um, you know, I'll never forget, you know, it's a once in a lifetime type of thing. And your 25th movie anniversary is immortalized on a cover in part oh. of the Emerging Civil War books. It's yeah. actually the Engaging the Civil War series on entertaining history, the Civil War in literature, film, and song. So if you're looking there on the screen for our viewers, um, Frank is in the photo. He's standing at the movie theater. I believe it's the Majestic, right? Um, yeah. And so you're there and it's it the photo is the one in the upper left of the photo quadrant there on the cover. So there's also a black and white version of the photo in the Civil War and Pop Culture essay collection as well. So, yeah, and Chris even was uh, kind enough to give my wife credit for taking the photo. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Her <laughs> name's in print as well. Yeah, I told her she was excited about that. Um, but I think that was right before we went in to watch it. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, it was such a great experience. That's really great. And it's been mentioned a few times. Um, we're planning to share this video on the weekend that the big Gettysburg 30th anniversary, I think they're calling it the film festival, um, is happening in the town of Gettysburg. Um, so maybe we'll be seeing some ECW friends there. It sounds like you're going to be there, Tom. Is that right? I'll be there. Sounds great. I'm going to be there as well helping out with some american battlefield trust projects so it should be really exciting and, and like has been mentioned it's going to be interesting to see the people that come together for it and you know what what demographic do we see um you know what type of fan club is there and you know just people who've experienced this movie in different ways and are going to get to share those memories and hopefully share those memories and its impact with um, those who helped to create it so Hopefully it'll be a special event for all involved. Well, we've been chatting for a little while here and it's probably about time to wrap up the discussion. So we'll just go around um, like we've kind of been doing. If you want to share some final thoughts about the movie, the movie's legacy, those sorts of things. Um, let's do that as we're closing out our discussions. Let's see, Brian, we'll start with you. Love the movie. 
<laughs> to this day. Um, I rank it up there with glory. Twice as long to watch, but I rank it up there with glory as the two best Civil War films of all time. Excellent. We'll have to have a, a roundtable discussion about glory sometime soon, too. That would be a fun <laughs> one to, to uh, discuss as well. Frank, thoughts on legacy or the movie? Yeah, I mean, like, Brian, I mean, it's one of my top favorite movies up there with Zulu. 1964. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it just it I grew up watching it. I mean, it just it made an impact on me, uh, it made me really dig into more reading about these individuals. I mean, Chamberlain, Hancock, um, you know, Reynolds, all of these guys. Um, yeah, I just I can't even begin to express how much it impacted me over the years. And just um, even though it's a movie, you know, it's still you know, it's, it's, it's something that if you're interested in Gettysburg, I feel like you, you have to watch it. It's like a rite of passage. Yeah. It has that inspiring factor that draws you in and then keeps you watching it. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Um, Tom thoughts. Um, I think Tom's zoom might've frozen. So Dan, we'll, we'll switch to you. Sure. I mean, definitely, uh, a personal impact on me for sure um you know the movie was a part of changing the trajectory of uh, what i wanted to do in future years i ultimately led me to gettysburg college and an internship at the park and year after year after year as a seasonal ranger with the park service at gettysburg so definitely a profound um, moment from the first time I saw it to the 100th and plus uh, time that, that I've seen the movie. So it definitely has that um, personal legacy, but I think also it has a much larger legacy. And, and one of the things that, you know, we strive to do as park service rangers at Gettysburg is tell that story and um, hopefully create future stewards. So those that come and understand what, what, what a powerful story this is and, and that this story needs to to live on and that landscape needs to live on for future generations. So, you know, to kind of blend a, a, a Chamberlain quote, uh, you know, great field, something abides and in great Civil War movies, something lingers. So, <laughs> yeah, that's good. good. Very eloquent. Thanks for sharing that, Dan. Um, Tom, you get the final word here. Thoughts on the movie and legacy. Is yeah, well, that. I said going back to my personal story, I mean, it really did change my life. It sounds odd, but it got me into the Civil War, and it's been my number one hobby since then. So I appreciate I met my wife because of this movie. She knows more lines than I do. But I think the overall impact was getting people interested. And we're still talking about that. And I know that I, I know it's not as popular as it used to be, used to, to what to what Dan said, used to walk in the shops here in Gettysburg, and they were all playing the the movie soundtrack. I mean, th those days are gone, um, but it still has an impact. I still would like people to see it, and even if it's just a certain generation that loves it, we love it. It impacted us, and I look forward to seeing all those folks uh, at at the Gettysburg celebration. I hope it continues, but it 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 will always have that legacy combined with the Ken Burns series. That time, the golden era, I think, of Civil War visitation was in the '90s and early 2000s, and a big part of it has to do with the movie Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. That's a great observation, and I love to use one of my icebreaker questions when I'm meeting people at conferences or Civil War roundtables, you know, what got you interested in, in Civil War history? And if people talk about films or watching media, it's either Ken Burns or the movie Gettysburg. So we can't underestimate that impact. And then thinking about what that um, that vast interest in the Civil War in the early 90s, what it's led to with battlefield preservation, with more publishing, with the next generation of historians being inspired and all of that. And, you know, maybe it's something that, that we think about as we're going forward. I know we've kind of jokingly said, oh, we need a Culp Cell uh, version of this. But, you know, as much as we can have our our debates about historical fiction and how we use it and all that you know it is that question of what are we doing to inspire and you know where does inspiration find its place in in that tension of historical fact versus inspiration so definitely things that i hope that we can be thinking about and maybe even finding new paths forward as we're thinking about gettysburg on its 30th anniversary so i want to thank this wonderful group for joining me tonight um it's been such a fun discussion thanks for taking time out of your evening so frank brian dan tom thanks for being enthusiasts of the movie gettysburg as well as fine historians and thanks for joining me for this discussion Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Everybody Thanks, have Sarah. a good evening. <laughs>